Hi, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well this evening. Uh, I am Eve Engler. This is the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour. I'm coming to you from uh, Jojage, which has long been a meeting place of various First Nations, otherwise known as Montreal. We have a special guest this evening, so I'll get uh, right to uh, development so we have time uh, for uh, uh, Dimitri to, uh, uh, to have a proper discussion and questions and all that kind of stuff with uh, Dimitri Lascaris, who is our special guest this evening. Um, so the following on from the Human Rights Watch report of a few days, about a, 10 days, two weeks ago, the UN um, expert panel on Congo released a report uh, three, four days ago. There was an article about it in the Financial Times, uh, a few other places. Yeah. Um, and they confirmed what we, we sort of already knew, which is that Rwanda is backing the M23, who've been sowing chaos in Eastern Congo for the past uh, 16, 18 months. Uh, and of course, there's a longer history there. Uh, they, the report said that they were the Rwandans were back in the M23 uh, to take control over mine uh, mine sites. Uh, and we've known that that big part of what's been going on in Congo is the pillaging of the vast resources in Eastern Congo. And uh, in response to this report, uh, Judy Rever, who wrote a very good book in 2018 about the, the, the killings uh, by the uh, RPF, by the Rwandan uh, current government, the Paul Kagame-led government in the Congo and also uh, in, uh, in Rwanda. She uh, showed a picture uh, of uh, Romeo Dallaire uh, and she said, General Romeo Dallaire next to Rwanda's James Kabareme, Karababe, who oversaw troops that stalked and slaughtered civilians in Zaire in 1966-97. He is now behind deadly Rwandan ops in Eastern Congo. How much longer will Canada fund Rwanda's army via the Dallaire Institution Institute? This is aiding and abetting crimes. And so uh, Romeo Dallaire, I'm not going to get into all of it, though it's fascinating, fascinating uh, history. The single biggest propaganda in Canadian foreign policy is the fact that there is a book called Le Patron de Dallaire Pal, the boss of Dallaire Speaks, that is from a Jacques Roger Boubou, who is the head of the, uh, the overall political mission, former Cameroon foreign minister, critical of Dallaire's role in Rwanda in 1993 and 94. And Dallaire has allied himself uh, with Paul Kagame uh, for decades. And uh, his institute uh, is currently getting Canadian government funding for projects in, in, uh, in Rwanda, partly on, on uh, child soldiers, even though Rwanda has been found to be using child soldiers in Congo. It, honestly, it's, it's a total scandal. Uh, it gets very little attention, uh, far from as much attention as it should des that it deserves. Uh, Kaur Babe uh, moved his family to Canada a few years ago, his wife apparently living here. I should also say that Dallaire is going to be in Rwanda for this big uh, um, festival in August. Uh, uh, so this continues, right? This isn't just some historical thing. Dallaire doesn't know what Kagame has been doing in Eastern Congo. Um, he's right there in continuing to ally, even as big swath of the corporate media has, has sort of turned against Kagame for his crimes internally and externally. Uh, and uh, the Canadian government, uh, our great humanitarian Roma Dallaire uh, continue with this. I should also point out, also point out uh, the, the head of the Raptors, the president of the Raptors, uh, Masai Ujiri, um, he is somebody with his giants for Africa who's become a tight, tight ally with Kagame. And honestly, again, there's no, no politician with more African blood on his hands than, than Paul Kagame. And this idea that you're this, this Pan-Africanist, like the Raptors president is supposedly your Giants for Africa project, but you're deeply tied in with Kagame is honestly completely, it's just utter um, ridiculousness. And, but it goes in our, uh, in our media uh, uh, climate. So yesterday here in Montreal, it was wild. Walking outside in the morning, uh, the, the uh, smoke, uh, the smog that count, comes from the forest fires that have been burning for weeks now was just incredible. 
uh, the apparently Montreal, the worst air anywhere in the world. And you could feel it. You could see it. Uh, you're supposed to stay indoors. I tried to keep the kids inside. Uh, you walking from the, the Bibliothèque Nationale, the library, into the metro, walking into the metro, and you could just feel this like smoggy stuff that was in the metro even. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it, you know, it's what we're going to get more of with these, with forest fires, climate disturbances, there's all kinds of reports seen in recent days and weeks about the, the increased uh, temperature within the oceans and the impacts, uh, more and more climate disturbances, more and more health impacts from this. And yet, Le Devoir reported a couple days ago, uh, the story saying that, uh, Tar sands production is expected to reach 3.7 million barrels per day by 2030, half a million barrels uh, per day more than today, and an increase of 140,000 in 2030 over what was forecasted last year. Okay, so these are get, they're getting bigger, right? <laughs> like as climate disturbances are getting further and further out of hand, the production is going up and the planned production is going up. Uh, and it pointed out that capital expenditure in 2022 was highest since 2015. And capital expenditure is not about today, it's about you know, further afield. They are planning on increasing production of this heavy, you know, dirty, heavy carbon emitting fuel, greenhouse gas emitting fuel onwards, okay? And um, the S&P, according to this Ludovic Wall story, S&P Global, Canada sh uh, sh will continue to add projections. Canada will continue to add new production and export records before, as a quote, a very slight decline begins to appear in 2030, in early 2030s. So there's going to be a very slight decline in the tw in 2030s. I mean, this is complete and utter ecocide. We are just totally pushing ourselves over the cliff. It's absolute bananas in one of the wealthiest countries in the world with what some of the highest historic and current carbon uh, or greenhouse gas emissions per capita, we are just going to keep increasing this highly uh, uh, GHG heavy form of fuel. And, uh, and that's just the plan and we're just gonna just keep going. Le Devoir, the next day, I think on Thursday, had a, had a very rare but important article entitled La Pollution Militaire Encore, encore Loin de Disparaître. So military pollution is still far from disappearing. This is one of the first articles I've seen in a major paper that documents how ecologically damaging the Canadian military is. And it, it, it puts forward a, few, a number of stats one of them basically says that DND is responsible 1,113 kilotons of CO2 equivalent in 2021-2022, more than all other federal government activities combined. Right? So DND, we've known that, we've known that, it's nothing new, but DND is responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions than all other federal government activities combined. But the Trudeau government decided to leave it out of their net zero plan, right? The net zero plan itself is a joke, but they don't even put the military, you know, reducing the military into the net zero plan. Um, but so, yeah, so this is a, you know, important article in, in, in that delves into the subject. That's a the real scandal about the military's role in uh, 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 climate change. Bob Ray, our ambassador to the UN, tweeted about uh, the horrible uh, tragedy of the refugees uh, or migrants that, that uh, uh, died uh, by Greek, uh, uh, just outside, I guess, just outside of, just inside of Greek territorial waters. Uh, I don't know exact number, 700, 600, you know, huge tragedy about a week ago. Uh, he talked about it in very kind of humanistic uh, terms on Twitter. Bob Ray, of course, uh, backed NATO's destruction of Libya. Uh, which has been an important part in this rise of these horrible uh, 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 human traffic smugglers from uh, Libya, including these people who, who died, who paid huge amounts of money and then were put onto this boat, overwhelmed, that was you know, way over capacity and, uh, and uh, died. Bob Ray was a big proponent uh, of that bombing of Libya. Of course, you'll never uh, talk about that, in, certainly in the context of the... Um, the uh, deaths at sea. 
The Globe and Mail reported on uh, uh, front page that EDC finds 882 pages of files after second challenge of search. So they've had this big thing on um, the access to information and how bad the access to information legislation is across the country in different domains. And Export Development Canada, which is a, uh, uh, a um, insurance and uh, export credit uh, agency that basically subsidizes and protects Canadian uh, global um, uh, um, uh, business. It 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 it's, it uh, um, provides insurance for different uh, different uh, deals, global deals. It's like forty billion dollars a year of different uh, 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 credits and and loans and whatnot that it that it provides. It's a really important part of Canadian foreign policy that's under under discussed. And um, and the story uh, talks about it about the 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 infamous Gupta the Gupta plane and their financing of the the Indian. Um, uh, corrupt uh, Indian, uh, uh, South African Indian uh, uh, family that was uh, 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 funding uh, uh, the the, uh, the former uh, uh, president of South Africa. Uh, but in this story, they point out that that EDC doesn't it fulfills about three percent of of uh, of its requests access to information requests. So it's a total black hole of information. It's incredibly, and that's been going on for years, decades. It's been reports on EDC and how they, it's, it's all totally secretive and then they claim to you know, do better. Um, but it's just, it's, it's an, an element of Canadian foreign policy that needs to be discussed and also how, how secretive they are uh, needs, to be, uh, needs to be kind of uh, pushed back, uh, uh, pushed back against. Um, a couple of days ago, Canada sanctioned uh, three gang members in Haiti and André Aped, which is very fascinating. André Aped was a key ally in the 2004, maybe the key ally in Canada, US, France's ouster of the elected uh, president and thousands of elected officials in 2004. And uh, he's a light skinned guy of, of Middle Eastern descent. He's a sweatshop owner in Haiti. He he was um, his uh, operations were the prime subcontractor of Gildan, the Montreal-based Gildan Activewear at the time of the coup. And Aped led up the uh, he headed the group of 184, which was the the opposition civil society group of supposedly 184 groups that it, from you know all different sectors of political life that came out against Aristide's government. Canada funded a whole bunch of these groups that were part of the 184. And they provided part of the, you know, sort of um, protests and destabilization that helped legitimate the rebel attacks and then the uh, uh, foreign military intervention. And Aped was accused of funding Guy Philippe, the, the rebels. Guy Philippe himself actually went on radio and said that Aped had funded his, his, uh, his rebels that came in from the Dominican Republic to, to uh, destabilize the Aristide government. And uh, after, right after he did that, the, D, D, the DEA from the U.S. Uh, targeted uh, Guy Philippe, basically stop talking and, uh, and your drug running is OK. Um, but uh, but uh, so, so, they, so, so targeting a pet is this is like a big fish, somebody who's been very tied into Canada. Uh, a pet is, is, uh, is somebody who's also been, a, you know, very, continues to be very influential in Haiti. Right after um, Jovenel Moïse extended his mandate beyond uh, February 7, 2021, Aped got this big uh, gift from Moïse, 8,600 8, hectares of agricultural land to grow stevia uh, for, for Coca-Cola, for their Coca-Cola sugar-free and a big investment to a, an agricultural export zone. Um, uh, so the the targeting of a ped is is a, a like a real reversal of Canadian policy, which has been totally tied into the Aped family going back decades, really. Um, and uh, and it it speaks to a little bit of just sort of where now Haiti policy they're all over the map. As we as I reported on last week, the Canadian government announced this big plan to assist the Haitian police via the Dominican Republic. They announced this about $20 million, I believe, the new money they said they were going to devote to this. 
And then the next day, the Dominican came out and said, well, we didn't okay this. This, this is our, our territory. You can't use this as your base of operations for what you're doing in Haiti. And then two days ago, um, uh, Melanie Jolie met with her Dominican counterpart uh, to discuss this and reiterated that Canada is going to be using its embassy in the Dominican to uh, um, fulfill this new this plan of helping the Haitian police. So it's, it's all a little unclear what's going on here, but it clearly the Canadian government is basically not backing down vis-a-vis -vis the Dominican government. And, um, and uh, it's, um, it's a sort of continuation of this, what I actually think increasingly think is actually very uh, incompetent policy. Like I said last week, I don't, I don't think that's usually a criticism I make of Canadian foreign policy, that it's a question of incompetence, though there of course is incompetence all throughout, but, but in this case, it seems to be increasingly, there's this, this sort of, uh, they don't know what the hell to do, and uh, they don't want to back away from their uh, pro-US, pro-core group imperial position, but it's also a total disaster, and it's a disaster that's not necessarily even good for a lot of Canadian corporate interests in Haiti, um, and, uh, and they're sort of trying to, uh, to, to react, uh, and now uh, even uh, targeting, sanctioning, some uh, former top uh, allies. A couple days ago, the Ottawa City Council opened up this, this sort of um, this uh, uh, monument to uh, Masa Amin, Aminal, Amini, sorry, the Iranian who was killed, uh, I guess, back in September uh, that launched, that instigated the whole protest we've seen over the past eight or nine months in, uh, in Iran. And what to me was interesting about this was that Joel Hardin, the Ontario MPP, you know, the far left of the of the Ontario NDP, somebody actually actually stayed at his house, and somebody I know, uh, very very nice guy, you know, politically, uh, you know, being totally in the right direction. He showed up for this ceremony at what was the what, what used to be the the Iranian uh, embassy in Ottawa that's been closed now for more than a decade since the Harper government. Uh, ended diplomatic relations. And I, and I just thought like, you know, obviously there's lots of repression in Iran. Obviously if, you know, forcing women to wear veils is something I, I disagree with. But I just like the idea that this is like the far left of official Canadian politics. We feel the need to show up for this. And it's really like, it's the victims of our enemies, you know? Like, like, you know, Pierre-Antoine Levinsky, I bet you no one on this call even knows who Pierre-Antoine Levinsky is, but Pierre-Antoine Levinsky, in 2007, he disappeared in Port-au-Prince, just after he was with actually a delegation of Haiti Solidarity people from Canada. Levinsky took me into uh, City Soleil to meet with one of the, uh, the, political, the political, the sort of political gangsters, top well-known at the time, uh, he took me around, uh, 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 that was during the UN occupation, of course, uh, you know, so I didn't know him personally in a great way, but I, you know, I, Boston events there and in Washington, DC, this guy, he was the head of the Fondation uh, 30 September, which was the day that Aristide was overthrown back in, in, in 1991. And it was the, the victims of the first coup, the thousands of victims. And Levinsky was this like, basically he was somebody who was like, you know, from an educated background. Uh, dark skin, like a, a black Haitian, not a not a lighter skin Haitian, um, and that that uh, was from like you know he's like educated, but he still was connected in with the people in City Soleil, like the poorest people in the hemisphere. I mean the the most shocking poverty, and and you know so this you know it, I mean we, like a real engaged intellectual, if you like, a real engaged uh, uh, activist of like you know with a global element, and then with the real on the ground. And he's just disappeared. We, we never know. We've never, we don't know who did it. We know who did it in a macro sense. We don't know who did it in a micro sense. We knew it was the forces that Canada backed in Haiti and the most regressive people. This is like a, you know, if, if there's going to be a monument in Ottawa for a, 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 a social movement, you know, leader or instigator, well, Levinsky would be one of them. Or how about, how about uh, Mariano uh, Abarca, who was killed but after you know, protesting Calgary-based Black Fire exploration in Mexico, he's a name that actually some people know about. Is the campaign's been going on for 14 years, right? This is a victim 
of Canadian foreign policy, you know, somewhat indirectly, but but clearly of you know the company was the, was the player, right? The Canadian embassy was backing the company, and they the security forces uh, 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 killed him. So I just to see how like even the, the far left of official politics, it's the it's the it's the uh, it's the opponents of the of the enemy regimes, right? That's who we get to celebrate. We don't celebrate these people who were, you know, taken out all, all the people in Libya that were taken out Canadian policy. I mean, Haiti would be gone and on and on about different people who were, you know, directly targeted by Canada that were that were that were killed. There's no monuments for any of those people. And there's no like leftists who, who you know, in official politics who are demanding the monuments for Pierre Anton Levinsky in Ottawa uh, or, or the other, uh, uh, you know, great activists challenging Canada's uh, uh, imperialism. Um, I want to probably, I should move through quickly because I want to give some time, proper time to uh, Dimitri, but I just want to mention it was the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Exclusion Act. There was a big commemoration in, in, um, in, uh, in Ottawa. Um, uh, but alongside that, we have a lot of this sort of like continued kind of, uh, you know, Chinese threat uh, uh, kind of dynamic. The, I think the Journal de Montréal, published a story titled, Un sénateur veut récolter des fonds pour poursuivre des journalistes malhonnêtes. So a senator wants to uh, raise funds to, uh, to pursue, legally speaking, uh, uh, dishonest journalists. And a, co a conservative appointed senator of Chinese background, uh, basically at some uh, community event, said that the community should start raising funds to push back against this, these, these campaigns where they just get accused of, you know, whatever, of being Chinese agents and Chinese police stations and da 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 and, and start pushing back against that. Honestly, totally reasonable, totally reasonable position, but they, they spin it as if, as if it's all part of this sort of like the, you know, they're going to target the, the upstanding journalists and, and, and it's all part of the, the, the you know, Pro Beijing Chinese community, whatever, um, and you know, kind of fits within the whole history of of, uh, of the Exclusion Act, and of course, we've discussed that issue a lot uh, in 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 recent uh, uh, sessions. Um, so I want to make just uh, uh, there was a Globe had a piece titled "Sanctions Urged Over Tibetan Schools." So now we you know we have sanctions over Xinjiang and the Uyghur question. And now we're talking about more sanctions around Tibetan schools and how Tibetan schools are like Canada's residential schools and we need to start sanctioning China on that. And the American government, uh, there's a big report published on Thursday or Friday based upon a congressional committee or something like that about um, basically, about basically uh, a number of these different Chinese companies, apps that one of them that sells like low end uh, clothing like five and six dollar tank tops apparently apparently is very popular with the young Americans and uh, and different kind of apparel and stuff like that and and talking about how they're they're basically abusing the American system and it goes into different things and and what what it got me going on thinking about is that so all these sanctions that they've been bringing in against China the the claim is that it's security issue right and so it's all basically all of high tech stuff can be argued as in some way or another having a national security element to it. Okay, now tank top, importing tank tops, it's hard to make the national security element on that, right? But now what they're saying is that, well, the cotton, the cotton is coming from Xinjiang and it's like slave cotton, right? And, and so now we're gonna have to sanction this company, this, this, this online platform. I'm not exactly clear what this, this the couple of different companies are talking about. We're gonna to have to start blocking them because because it's it's you know it's a human rights element. So it's a national security at the high tech end. It's a human rights question, and that's this is what we're going towards. And this is what the Tibet thing is about in Canada as well, right? You're gonna to move to provide the justification for more and more of this decoupling of the sanction sanctioning of China, um, which who knows where it will all go. Um, uh, it could be at really bad. And and one thing I. I with Narendra Modi's visit to Washington, I don't know if people followed that, but you know, the Indian Indian uh, uh, Prime Minister's visit to uh, uh, Washington, um, 
a big deal and they were all about how the Americans were giving all kinds of good deals to the Indians to, to turn India against China was essentially the essence of the whole thing. And it's amazing in all this is that like, you know, we're, we're talking about, about the mistreatment, China's mistreatment of Muslims in, in, in Xinjiang, which is like, even if you believe the worst of what's being accused, it's quite marginal. It's a fairly small number of people. It's, it's quite marginal to Chinese politics. Now, anti-Muslim policy within India and Narendra Modi, it's like, it's a central, it's a, a very important part of their politics, right? You got 220 million Muslims in India and they're you know, trying to disenfranchise them. There's, you know, Modi himself comes out of the, 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 the massacres back in 2002 in uh, uh, Gujarat, like 2000 Muslims killed. He's been pushing all kinds of viciously anti-Muslim policies. And we're all about like, we're all fine with like, you know, getting close to him, um, but yet, China and how China's mistreatment of Muslims is, you know, is this big, big deal that we have to, uh, you know, decouple based upon. Um, the, the Mike Blanchfield, the former Canadian press reporter, uh, I just noticed that he now works for Blue Sky Strategy Group. He was a military person, foreign policy military person at Canadian Press, obviously a terrible reporter, total psychophant of, of, of the military and of the foreign policy establishment. Now he is officially lobbying for Canadian arms company. That's what he, he works for this, uh, this, this, uh, this lobbying firm in Ottawa, right after working for Canadian Press and is openly lobbying for Canadian arms company. He's also uh, got a fellowship with the Canadian Global Affairs Institute, which of course is funded by arms companies and d and uh, And this is just a little glimpse into the, the network in Ottawa, right? I talk about the propaganda system of the, the, just, just the different institutions, and all the money they have and the individuals floating through them. And it explains so much of, of the one-sided uh, uh, view of Canadian foreign policy and military policy that we, uh, that we see. Um, there's, I wanna say that there's, uh, there's gonna be, there is increasing push about Canada increasing military spending to the 2% of GDP as per the NATO uh, business in the summit coming up in the NATO summit. And there's gonna be a protest here in Montreal, July 11th to 12th, while the summit's happening. I think there might be in other cities and people should check that out. Um, the Globe had a piece titled, uh, Canada urged to create trust fund to distribute seized Russian assets to Ukraine. And it's an interview with uh, Lloyd Axworthy, the former foreign affairs minister who heads up the World Refugee and Migration Council that has proposed the Canadian-Ukrainian Social Impact Reconstruction Trust Fund. And basically Russian assets in Canada will be taken, given to this trust fund, and then uh, given the, the, the sell-off or the resources themselves will be given to the Ukrainian government or projects in Ukraine. Uh, obviously from the Russian perspective, this is just theft. And uh, Axworthy is quoted saying, quote, it's a Robin Hood proposition. You take from the sheriff of Nottingham who was putting people in jail and you give it to the people who were affected by this, uh, which all sounds kind of nice and good. Well, Axworthy, of course, was Canada's foreign minister during the NATO bombing of Yugoslavia. He was foreign minister uh, while Trudeau, Krejci, part of the time Krejci was very much pushing NATO expansion east. I don't think there was anybody, and certainly not Axworthy, saying that that Canadian assets should have been given to Serbia for what all the infrastructure and destruction that Canada leveled in Serbia. That wasn't, no one was talking about that. Uh, but now they're comfortable saying that around, around, um, around Russia and Ukraine. Um, so moving towards uh, uh, our special guest, uh, uh, Dimitri Laskaris, former uh, Green Party candidate, there has been an incredible campaign against his tour that's taking place across the country. And just before uh, introducing uh, Dimitri, I just wanted to give a little, I think, historical context to um, what we're seeing, right? We, history um, is that there is uh, um, been incredible repression against anti-war activism and voices. Like during World War I, 
War Measures Act led to the, the shutting down of a couple hundred media outlets, banning of books. Uh, there was many, many people, uh, uh, hundreds arrested. There was organizations like the International Workers of the World, uh, different leftist pacifist groups, more than a dozen shut down. Public meetings held in Ukrainian, Russian, Finnish were shut down. Uh, there was obviously internment of thousands of, of Ukrainian Canadians and others. Uh, there was 24,000 political trials. During World War II, the Communist Party was banned and uh, RCMP arrested uh, many dozens, of, uh, members from dozens of organizations. Hundreds were interned. The head of the Canadian Siemens Union, the mayor of Montreal, uh, obviously the internment of Japanese, dozens of publications, more than a dozen publications shuttered. Uh, corporate outlets like Vancouver Sun, Le Devoir, Le Soleil, uh, fined for what they published. 45 million uh, letters were opened. Uh, during the Korean War, you had official censorship. There was official censorship in World War I, World War II. During the Korean War, there was official censorship in theater, both in Korea and Japan. There were uh, uh, more than a dozen reporters expelled. Uh, there was all kinds of pressure against uh, media outlets uh, by the government and, and officials. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, Canadian Peace Congress was targeted viciously. The head of the Peace, Peace Congress, um, Endicott, I'm forgetting his first name right now, uh, was called a Red Stooge by Lester Pearson, Canada's external minister. Bait on the end of a red hook. So basically it's just a, you know, a communist. Uh, uh, they they attacked uh, Peace Congress meetings. The government denounced Peace Congress and Peace Congress wasn't able to host meetings. And ultimately, Peace Congress meeting at Endicott's home was firebombed. And this is what this type of, I mean, I'm not saying what's happening to Dimitri's tour is, is exactly on par with this. But I would say that, you know, if you look at Libya 2011, Afghanistan, there was all kinds of very repressive things that happened. And we can get into a whole discussion of how the media was manipulated, but there wasn't that, that level of, of attacks against anti-war activism that we're seeing today. And I, I, I really believe that they, they we're seeing something uh, distinct from what I can remember over the past 20 years of witnessing in terms of how repressive it is against, I'm not sure maybe about early 90s with the first Iraq war, I don't in the research I did, I, I don't I don't know of any examples as as seemingly ex extreme as what's happening today. Uh, that that maybe I didn't look you know I haven't looked at it very deeply, but but certainly the Korean War is is you know worse than what we're seeing today. Um, but but what we're seeing today, I think, kind of harkens back to a, a different time of suppression of anti-war uh, uh, activism, and so um, I think it's disturbing. I think anyone who you know not just is opposed to the NATO proxy war, but 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 is you know just concerned about the state of democracy and obviously peace and anti-war uh, should be concerned about that. And so um, I thought I'd have Dimitri on to discuss it. Now, unfortunately, I'm not able to find Dimitri in uh, in my list of a uh, uh, list of. Oh, there I go. I got him. I got him. Uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, so yeah. So yeah. So so. Um, I'm gonna MS mute and uh, spot. Okay, so so uh, I, I think you should be able to un, un, unmute yourself now, uh, Demetrius. So first of all, uh, thanks a lot for for coming on. I know you're out west, and and I think you have an event this uh, this evening. Um, but but I guess the first thing I just ask is just uh, I get you know be, maybe a bit of a summary of the tour, and then a, just a you know quick overview of some of what's uh, what's happened. Sure. Can you hear me well now? Okay. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Um, so the tour was conceived by, um, uh, I think, Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War and other peace groups in the Canada-wide uh, Peace and Justice Initiative. And um, they approached me uh, after I uh, completed a one-month trip to Russia in April, which I took on my own initiative. Uh, there was no welcoming committee. It was entirely at my own expense. And uh, I agreed to do the tour, and we ended up... Uh, uh, finding local organizers across the country uh, to set up uh, speeches, I think, in 11 cities. So, so far, I've, I've gone to London, Ontario, my hometown. That's where we started on June 19th. Then we went to uh, Hamilton, Toronto, 
uh, Winnipeg, Regina. I arrived in Vancouver two days ago. Yesterday, we had a gathering of peace activists in a park in Vancouver. Tonight, I'm speaking in Vancouver. Tomorrow in Victoria. I'll be back in Montreal on June 29th. Halifax, the 30th of June. Fredericton, the 2nd of July. Ottawa, the 3rd of July. And the 4th of July, we will have a national webinar for those who couldn't attend. Um, so far, I have to say, I mean, there's been a tremendous amount of, uh, I think it's fair to say, uh, hostility coming our way online uh, from people both inside and outside of Canada about this tour. Um, but the only place where we really had uh, an obstacle that we couldn't overcome was Toronto, unfortunately. And even there, I mean, we the event went off in London despite the uh, organizer or the, the owner of that venue receiving some quite harsh and intimidating emails, which included a lot of just shameless falsehoods about me. Uh, he stood his crown and we went ahead and it was a great event. It was standing room only. Uh, Hamilton, we had a very good turnout. Um, there, uh, it was held at Mohawk College. About 20 to 25 pro-Ukrainian protesters showed up uh, bearing Ukrainian flags. Uh, but ultimately, um, you know, the event went off, with, went off without a hitch. And although they stood outside in the hallway and made some noise during the proceedings, um, you know, we still had a very good discussion. And some of them actually paid for a ticket and came in. And by the way, I'm not being paid for this tour, just so you know, the, the costs of the, uh, uh, the entry are, are designed to defray the cost of the venue and associated costs. But I'm not uh, receiving any speaking fees, nor am I uh, being reimbursed for my travel expenses. These are all at my own expense, just as my trip to Russia was at my own expense. So anyways, Hamilton, despite the dis somewhat disruptive behavior, it, was all, it all went off well, and those who actually paid for a ticket and came in and who were opposed to what I, I said, we had a spirited discussion in the Q&A, which I thought was helpful. Uh, and I don't, I don't, you know, I, I never felt threatened or that that was not uh, a significant contribution to the discussion. Uh, I get to Toronto and we thought that the, uh, this was going to be held at the Ontario Public uh, Service Employees Union uh, on Wellesley. And we all believed that they were gonna stand their ground. They were coming under pressure and we knew that for several days. And then several hours beforehand, they canceled on us citing security concerns. Um, now, I, it is since I've gained a lot more information about what actually happened within the past 24 hours and we come back to that, but I just wanna complete my summary. Um, so even though they canceled on the last minute and we weren't able to find another venue on such short notice, um, we sent out an email, we told people that they had been canceled. Nonetheless, I went to the venue and stood at the entrance with some of the organizers because we knew that some people were not gonna get the email. Uh, you know, and, and about 25 people ended up showing up anyway because they hadn't received the email. So we went to a, the patio of a pub right next door to the OPSU building and I made a presentation on the uh, patio uh, to these people and that was a very good discussion. Um, then I went to Winnipeg. Uh, that was the most uh, uh, remarkable experience I've had in terms of, you know, um, uh, just seeing local organizers, how determined they could be. Under pressure, the first venue canceled the day before I was supposed to speak. They got a second venue. That venue canceled after it came under pressure on the second day, or on the day, I'm sorry, the scheduled day of my speech. And then about three or four hours beforehand, they secured a third venue. And so we ultimately were able to hold the event. And uh, I think uh, somewhere in the range of 70 people showed up despite all of these shenanigans. Uh, and then I came out to Vancouver and I said, as I mentioned, we had a, uh, a really good discussion out in the park yesterday. There were no disruptions. About 40 people showed up and that was an invitation only event. And tonight I'll be speaking in Vancouver. So that's a summary of where we are. Uh, and so far, I have to tell you, Eve, I think uh, given in light of the efforts that were made uh, to disrupt it, I'm very encouraged by the number of people who've come out and the uh, caliber of the discussion. But there's no doubt, I think it's fair to say, there's no doubt that, you know, these efforts to silence us are having an impact. Uh, and and, and I, I, I'm quite astonished at how far people are willing to go uh, to silence people who are just interested in having a discussion about peace. Well, th that's what I find fascinating online. On Twitter, there's there's lots of people who are saying, they're not, they're not you know, saying 
express your concerns. They're saying, email them to shut the event down. And they're not, they're, they're bold about it. They're open about it. They're, they're boasting about it. They're, they boast about, we, hey, we got a big success at, in Toronto and now we should use the success to pressure other venues to, to shut down there. It's, it is an open campaign to shut down a uh, anti-war speaking tour. You can say it's a pro-Russia anti-war speaking tour, but the, it is, you know, so uh, it's, an, it's an open campaign to do that, which I find pretty remarkable how uh, uh, bold people are in that. And, and I think that it's obviously coordinated as well. It, there's elements that are, I think, uncoordinated, but I think there's probably elements we're not seeing on Twitter or Facebook. Uh, I don't know whether it's the Ukrainian Canadian Congress that are sharing emails uh, privately. I, I strongly assume that's happening. Um, uh, we also we also are seeing uh, uh, yeah. I mean, just also, I think that element that I think you, you touched on, but it's also really important for people to understand. This is all volunteer organized stuff, right? And, and I know I saw people like beforehand the whole like ticketing. That's a that's a not something that is the standard practice at left wing events because we want everyone to come we don't want to the point is not to charge just to get people there maybe you have passed the hat maybe not but you want as many people to come but you have to start bringing in these things to avoid the ability of the other side to like cause you know the chaos um and i know that even like victoria they you were saying that they they figured out a way of messing up the event bright um uh by registering tons of people as a way to basically take all the tickets and then um, but so, so yeah, all these sort of different tactics and that kind of opening. So I, just, I want to mention, you know, speak a little bit about um, about maybe the Ukrainian Canadian Congress or who you think this who's doing this, but also Marcus Kolga and this this guy at the McDonald Laurie Institute, who is this big so-called disinformation expert who's like his 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 disinformation thing funded by the American government, but is, you know, <laughs> very comfortable to run around saying like Canadians shouldn't hear and you, you know, I'm sure they accuse you of being Russian paid. And now it yeah. looks in the, in the, in the, in the chat, I'm think I'm seeing some people saying, you know, they, if you're Russia paid, you're Russia paid, you're Russia paid. And then you say, well, actually I paid to do this trip myself. And they're like, Oh, he's privileged. He has the money to do it. He has the money to do it himself. Oh, you know, he can't listen to him because he's, he's privileged now. You know, it's like, anyway, so yeah, go ahead with the. Uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I am privileged. You're right. I, I I was I was born in a you know a, a family of poor Greek Greek immigrants who didn't have a uh, you know a month of high school education and they came to this country in the fifties because they were uh, they had no economic economic opportunities. But I was raised in this country. And. I had a very good career in law school, and and as a result of the career that I had in law school, uh, as a lawyer, yeah, I today am a privileged person, and that's exactly why I consider it my duty to use my privilege uh, to speak for people who came from a background like my own, but who weren't so fortunate uh, to be in the position that I'm in. Uh, and so I don't take any money. I don't even solicit donations on my website. I, I've never taken a dime for any of my speaking, any of my activism any of my journalism, whether it related to Russia or Ukraine, not a goddamn dime, because I'm fortunate to be in that position. And uh, I hope, I wish that more people who were in my position would do that. And frankly, they're just not that many. Marcus Kolga, on the other hand, as you mentioned, Eve, who works for the right-wing neoconservative uh, McDonald Laurie Institute, is effectively paid to smear people like you and me, paid to promote the agenda of the military industrial complex, uh, paid to uh, promote uh, Eastern European nationalism. I believe he himself is a, an Estonian Canadian ultra nationalist. That's as far as I can tell, that's exactly what he is. And, and he has been working with a guy uh, in uh, Latvia, who I understand is a uh, Ukrainian Russian who's devoted years of his life to being bitterly. Uh, you know, critical of the Russian government, and that's fine. I, I respect his right to criticize the Russian government, but he's turned his sights on me. His name is Alexei Kovalyev, uh, and he and Kolga, as far as I can tell, have been working uh, together with some assistance from this character from the University of Calgary named J.C. Boucher, another so-called disinformation expert uh, who receives funding, I, I believe, to the tune of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars from, you know, uh, the Canadian War Ministry and other 
uh, no, he, it boasted he, his 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 bio boasted that he received two point four million dollars in D and D funds. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Thank you for uh, reminding me. It's a large sum of money, and that's what we know about. Who knows how much funding he may have received from directly or indirectly from the military industrial complex to do his so-called disinformation research. And these guys have been putting out uh, emails. That I found I, that since June 1st, it was around that time that I announced this tour, there have been dozens and dozens and dozens of emails put out by these characters in which they are urging people uh, to shut us down and to, uh, they're giving them instructions on how to do it. So you mentioned Victoria. This guy in Latvia, Kovalia, told people to go on the uh, Eventbrite, Eventbrite registration. I don't believe they're charging any fees in Victoria. And, uh, and, and, and reserve like 10, 15, 20 tickets and not show up. So basically, they would just, I would end up showing up and speaking to an empty lecture hall. Uh, and so they had to fix that problem in Victoria. I understand they've done it. But they were literally getting instructions from a guy in Latvia, who, uh, you know, fine, you hate the Russian government, knock yourself out. You have lots of reason to criticize it. But why are you depriving me of my ability to speak freely? I have never, ever argued that somebody who criticizes the Russian government, supports NATO policy towards this war, this heinous war, which is imperiling the future of our children, should be deprived of the right to speak freely. Never. You want to debate me? I'll debate you anywhere, anytime. And if you know, evidence and logic on your, si uh, on your side, you should be able to win that debate. But they don't want to debate you. They want to silence us because they can't win the damn debate. That's the reality. And I, I'm issuing this, this challenge here and now to Marcus Kolka. If you listen to this or you get this message, I stand ready to debate you anywhere or anytime on the question of whether the invasion of Ukraine was provoked by NATO. Pick a place, pick a time, Let's get a mutually agreeable moderator, and I will be there. I guarantee you, I would be shocked if that man will accept that, that, uh, that offer, uh, because ultimately they can't win this debate. And this is where we are today, where the anti-war movement is being shut down. And the last thing I want to say, because I'm sick and tired of seeing this criticism, you know, they, they, they say that you and I go and we disrupt people uh, who are publicly speaking uh, about things, you know, promoting policies which we think are offensive and imperialist and, and harming innocent people. And they say that it's hypocritical because we're complaining we're being shut down. Well, let, let, let's be very clear here. There's a whole difference between showing up and, you know, and, and expressing your view for a few minutes and then being told to leave the premises and then some powerful influential person gets to finish his, his or her speech and then depriving somebody of a venue altogether, first of all. I've never done that. I get to, you know, express my opinion in these disruptions for maybe 30 seconds, and then I'm let out the door by VP security guards and the speech continues. I've never deplatformed anybody. I've never deprived anybody of a platform. But secondly, the people that I'm disrupting are people who are powerful and who constantly get to express their opinions in the mainstream media. That's why people like you and me, I think, are disrupting them, is because the only way we can be heard is by showing up at their speaking events and expressing our opinions. Uh, they get all the opportunity in the world to say what they want to say in the mainstream media. Nobody deplatforms them. They don't get marginalized by the mainstream media. It's the only way that we can get through to the public. If I was given the opportunity, you know, I'm invited on all sorts of media platforms outside of the West to express my views. But if the mainstream media was giving me an, a comparable opportunity, I wouldn't have to show up at, you know, Bob Ray speeches and Melanie Jolie speeches and Pierre Trudeau speeches to uh, blow off steam and express my view. The reason why we have to do that is because we have no other way to reach the Canadian public other than these personal meetings and these disruptions. They, however, the people who are promoting an imperialist and uh, incredibly destructive agenda that's ruining the planet and imperiling the future of our children, they get to speak nonstop without a single critical intelligent question being put to them by the so-called journalists in the Canadian mainstream media. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a really important point, and it, it's actually, you know, a point that probably my six-year-old uh, would understand. But in our in our political climate, it's incred incredibly uh, confused. It's it's, you know, they also they also are all about like the 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 uh, people who are challenging Canadian policy as being paid, 
when they're the ones that are getting all the pay. It's all volunteer on our side, but they're the ones that are all getting, like they're all being paid by D&D &D, or they have a, a, a cushy job at Global, the Global Mail pays them. It's just, it's stunning to see the, the level of, you know, I don't know, sort of at some level, just childish kind of uh, uh, discourse. But um, so, so uh, I've made, Laura, I've made you a co-host um and uh so you can start us off in terms of uh, uh questions people have questions and comments okay uh, so dimitri's good friend yuri has a question yuri can you unmute sorry i'll get can you unmute yuri yeah uh you're still muted hmm okay you're fine go ahead yuri Th uh thanks laura thanks even dimitri uh my uh Eve, quick, I have to ask a quick question about uh, about uh, Delaire. Uh, when when you talk to anyone or anyone about uh, about the skeletons and you know and 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 Delaire's claws and what's and 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 what Paul Kagami has been doing to Congo and whatnot. I'm just curious what has been the response because oftentimes, uh, you know, you know, having a mom that comes from Congo, and when I talk to people about how Paul Kagami is no hero and whatnot, I find that the the response I get is people actually justify everything Paul Kagami does. In other words, they kind of normalize the unthinkable. The way people say, "Look, it's terrible what happens to the Palestinians, but what, but but, but Israel has the right to do it because of you know." <laughs> World War II grievances, and then Dimitri, I just wanted your, you know, you know, you know, your response to uh, to this. I mean, I'm just shocked that you know that the whole stand with Ukraine uh, uh, crowd, the the pro NATO crowd, and so forth. They have every, they have literally the entire media supporting their cause. They have the entire music industry, the entire entertainment industry. They have no shortages of an entire corporate media outlet across, you know, Europe that supports their that literally supports their cause. So why? So I just find and and RT and so many other outlets are censored. So so I just find so your 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 response to why do you feel that they that they that 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 they can't handle tiny amounts of people who have a different point of view, have a different perspective and literally go out of their way to censor you or to censor Eve or to censor our comrades at the World Socialist website and so forth when they have an abundance, an infinite abundance of places to air their point of view and, and, and so forth. So I'm, okay. I'm, I'm curious. Yeah. Okay, so let's let Dimitri ask that because we've got quite a few hands raised. And if everyone could keep their questions brief, that would be great. Go ahead, Dimitri. Uh, Dimitri, you're muted. Sorry, uh, just so you know, some I think somebody on your end needs to unmute me. And oh, then I can oh unmute sorry, that. okay, sorry. Okay, That's you're okay. unmuted now, sorry. Yeah, so. Great question, Yuri. Uh, good to see you. I, look, it, it, it's very simple. As soon as their House of Cards narrative comes into contact with reality, it comes crashing down because the evidence is so overwhelming in opposition to their narrative. I'm going to give you one quick example. Very simple example. They claim that you know our assertion that the uh, that the U.S. and the United States government in particular orchestrated a coup in 2014 in Ukraine is a Putin talking point. Well, we have a recording. We have a recording in which a State Department official, Victoria Nuland, prior to the overthrow of a democratically elected Ukrainian president, Viktor Yanukovych, you know, a few weeks before his overthrow in 2014, she tells the ambassador of the United States to Ukraine who the next prime minister is going to be in Ukraine. She just tells them straight up. And when she's told by the ambassador, the former ambassador, that the EU objects to this person and wants Valerie Klitschko to be the prime minister, she says, fuck the EU, if you'll excuse my, uh, my language. I mean, this is, this is ridiculous. George Friedman, the head of Stratfor, a geopolitical consulting firm that is closely allied with the US government, a few months later said that this was the most blatant coup in history. The most blatant coup in history from the head of Stratfor. And we're supposed to believe there was no coup whatsoever. 
I mean, so this is the reason why they're trying to shut us down. It's, it's not even, you know, you could be a, a second rate debater with only a passing familiarity with the historical evidence and you could kick the crap out of Marcus Volga in the debate because what they have to say is so contrary to the historical evidence. That's why they're trying to shut us down. I'll just say very briefly on, uh, on uh, Delaire, um, just as an example. So Judy Rever has a great book about Congo, right? Judy Rever is a Montreal author. Um, she doesn't touch Delaire in her book. The only, it was published by Penguin Canada. I wrote this article about it at the time. It, 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 the only reason it was published by Penguin Canada, got tons of media attention, is because of Delaire and Canada's association with Rwanda, right? It's all part of this like Canada mythology, whatever. But, but, and she's, you know, very good book, all kinds of evidence about the RPF doing, but she doesn't, del doesn't challenge the Delaire question because it wouldn't have been published if she would have challenged the Delaire question, right? So it just gives you a, I think like a, Delaire has been left out. There's no room for any criticism of Delaire. Like I said, there's a book by his boss on the UN mission in, uh, and uh, I, I did a thing in my, my book, Propaganda System, well, I looked into it and it was mentioned three times. Delaire's book about his role in Ron is like more than, I forget the numbers, but like 10,000 times in a Canadian newsstand search. Uh, uh, Jacques-Roger Boubou, the, the Cameroon foreign minister's book is mentioned three times. Only one time what you say is like an actual assessment of what he was accusing Delaire of. Um, so it's just deep, the deep mythology and Delaire gets, gets away with it. No, there's no one, you know, like no one willing to, he's just a saint. And, you know, he backed very clearly and continues to back the individual with the most African blood on his hands, Paul Gamble. That's just, the facts are overwhelming, but you're not really allowed to sort of challenge the Delaire myth. Okay, so actually I'm up next. And I was just gonna ask you, Dimitri, if you can give us a flavor of the Q&A in your sessions, like what are some of the key questions that keep, key concerns that people have that keep coming up and again and again in the discussions? Dimitri, did you hear me? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm at, I've got to ask you to unmute again, excuse me. Okay, sorry, I've unmuted you now, Dimitri. <laughs> Uh, and yet you're still muted. Uh, you know, okay. the, the, Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, number one question I've gotten is, what do we do next? Mm -hmm. you know, people are very, very concerned. Uh, I, I think there are far more people in our, our country and Western society generally who understand that we are living through the most dangerous moment in human history uh, than we are led to believe by the mainstream media. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of alarm up there and, and people are feeling, uh, my, my sense is that people are feeling that, uh, a lot of powerlessness about the situation. They kind of feel like they're being let off a cliff and there's no way to stop it. Um, and I'm here to tell you that uh, I, I guess the best way I can answer that question is by recounting, and this is one thing that I talk about in my presentation, um, a, 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 an excerpt from the memoir of Henry Kissinger, which Chris Hedges likes to talk about. That's how I found out about this. Um, and, and in that memoir, uh, Kissinger recounts how he and Nixon were looking out on the uh, Washington Mall at the height of the protest against the Vietnam War. They had surrounded the uh, White House with empty buses, using them as barricades. And uh, people were trying to climb over the barricades. And Henry Kissinger, I'm sorry, Nixon looks at Kissinger and says, Henry, they're coming to get us. And at that moment, it seems to have dawned upon Nixon that he had to bring an end to the war. As Chris Hedges has said far more eloquently than I could possibly ever say, un unless and until the people in power, the warmongers and the people who are driving us off the cliff have the fear of God in their hearts because the people demand peace and justice and we are literally climbing over the barricades, uh, I'm afraid that we won't see a change in the current policy, which is very likely going to lead to a disaster for us all. We need to get out in the streets. We can no longer be a silent majority. We have to be a very vocal majority, of course, a peaceful majority, but a majority that demands to be heard. And then we can finally bring an end to the, uh, this agenda of war, uh, which is going to lead to the ultimate calamity. Yes, exactly. Okay, Evelyn's up next. Evelyn, you're unmuted. Okay. Uh, first, 
I would like to know if friendship between court officials and uh, Canadians might help. And second, if yes, is there a way to achieve this? So, I, I, I don't know if it, I, unfortunately, um, our friend's uh, voice was breaking up when I was, uh, when she was speaking. Oh, so if, if that yeah. question was intended for me, if somebody yeah. could repeat the question. Okay, Evelyn, can you, can you repeat it, please? Your voice was breaking up. Okay, can I type it in the chat? Can I put uh, it in the well, chat? No, well, you could, or you could okay. just say it now. You're coming across. So would, would friendship, like Dimitri went to Russia to shake hands with people, obviously we cannot do all this. We cannot do that. Is there another way where we can do something which would be similar without going to our shop? Oh, okay. So I don't know if you yeah, heard, okay. did you hear that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Go yes, ahead. I did. Yes. Uh, well, it's, it's, it's getting harder and harder to find, but, you know, electronically, you can get a sense of what the perspective of uh, many Russians is. Of course, there are people in Russia uh, and Russian persons living outside of Russia who oppose the policies of the government. But by all accounts, by all reasonable accounts, the vast majority of the people within Russia currently support uh, the government's policies, and at least with respect to this particular conflict. And I think that what we should be doing is, and you can find it if you look online, is sharing their perspective, not necessarily because you agree with it, but because it is a perspective that has to be taken into account if we're going to solve this war peacefully. We cannot solve this war peacefully without hearing what the other side has to say and having a dialogue. I do believe it's, it's possible to facilitate that dialogue uh, without, it's more challenging, but you can do it without actually going to Russia, which obviously very few people in our position do right now. Um, and, and, and just, again, just for example, pointing out there was a commitment made not to expand NATO eastward. Uh, that commit that commit was violated. There was a coup in 2014. The evidence to support it is available even in the mainstream media. There is a very serious issue with neo-Nazism in the American in the Ukrainian military and security services. Plenty of evidence in the mainstream media online to support that. And this evidence needs to be presented to the public here in the West. Uh, in order for us to understand that there are some serious, serious and legitimate issues which have to be talked about. This is not a black and white conflict. It's much more complex than we're being led to believe. Okay, and just before we go on, Eve and Dimitri, are you okay? We're over time now, but is it okay because we have a number of questions, uh, hands raised. Can we take some more questions? Yeah, yeah, I, I would say try to, if we could try it for 7.15, 7.20, if that's okay with Dimitri. Okay, okay, great. Richard, go ahead, please. Yes, thank you, Laura. I'll be brief. Dimitri, we have the same situation in this country that you do, obviously. Our, uh, our mainstream media, even the written press, there's never op editorials against the war or any discussions about it. Jeffrey Sachs has tried to uh, get a, a piece in the New York Times. They wouldn't even take his piece either. And of course, we have uh, both parties are, are totally far. There's no dissent at all. And th the bottom line is, is this the hatred of Putin is so deep and so vicious, you know what I'm saying? And uh, and obviously, we don't have street people in the street now. No Americans are getting killed like uh, previous was, and the only ones dying is no NATO countries are, uh, in either. Uh, uh, people are dying. It's all the Ukrainians, soldiers, and the civilians that are dying. And I don't think we give a damn. To be honest with you, thanks a lot. Thank you. I mean, I, I, I agree with all of that. I mean, look, you know, I think that the, I think Western powers, particularly the U.S. government, learned a very painful lesson in the Vietnam War. And that is if Americans saw large numbers of American soldiers coming home in body bags, they would put an end to a, world, a war real quick. So they came up with this nefarious scheme. How do we wage war 
without incurring on our side very significant casualties. One of the ways that they do that, and my government in here in Canada is totally complicit in all of this. This is about all Western governments at this stage. We started, you know, mastering the art of destroying uh, countries, particularly vulnerable countries with no air defenses, using standoff weapons. We did that uh, in Afghanistan. We did it in Libya. Uh, we did it in Somalia. And so they minimize the casualties of their own soldiers while inflicting maximum casualties, not only on military personnel, but also on civilians in these poor countries. And the other way they did it was to find proxies to fight their wars for them. You know, in the case they couldn't do it by simply using standoff weapons, they needed to wage a land war, they found a proxy. And this is exactly, you're totally right, this is exactly what's happening in Ukraine. Our governments could not give a damn about the Ukrainian soldiers who are dying in the battlefield. And they are even openly boasting about the fact that they're inflicting pain upon Russia while using Ukrainians to do it. And it's disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. We need to bring an end to this precisely because the lives of Ukrainian soldiers are worth every bit as much as the lives of our own soldiers. We need to bring an end to this now. Thanks, Dimitri. Okay, Elizabeth Ecker, do you want to go ahead, please? Yeah. What would yeah What would you consider a possible conclusion to the conflict? What would you consider is actually possible to happen? No. Uh, and it very that, that is actually a very important question as well, which has uh, arisen quite often in my speeches thus far. I I think look, I, I I'm not a mind reader, so I'm going to answer your question by giving you my sense as a lawyer who's been involved in dispute resolution for decades, of how I interpret the statements I'm hearing coming from the Russian government. What I think the Russian government wants first and foremost is a new security architecture in Europe. So it doesn't, it wants a neutral Ukraine. It wants Ukraine to be neutral in the same way that Austria was neutral, Switzerland was neutral, Finland and Sweden. These countries managed to be prosperous and secure for decades. It is perfectly happy for that for, for Ukraine not to be pro-Russian, but to be neutral. I believe that to be the case. The second thing it wants at this stage uh, is territorial concessions. And that's a very difficult issue, obviously. Uh, my suggestion for how we deal with that, because there are legitimate criticisms and questions about these referenda that were held in southeastern Europe, Ukraine and Crimea, is that we have internationally supervised plebiscites on terms that are agreed, agreed to by both the Ukrainian and Russian governments, and that we allow the peoples living in these regions to decide for themselves. There's something in international law called the right to self-determination. It's a human right. And the people living in these regions have the right to determine their own future. I think we as, a, as an, in, the international community should facilitate that decision. And the third thing they want, I think the Russians, it's very important to them is that these uh, missile launchers, uh, which are nuclear capable, that the United States has positioned in Romania and Poland, which are a serious threat to the Russian Federation, be moved back. And I think they want those things, those military assets, moved back to the pre-1991 borders of NATO. Again, I, as a Westerner, I fully support that because I think the further apart these nuclear forces are, the safer we all will be. We don't want them right next to each other. Uh, I suspect that if an offer of that nature were put on the table, the Russian Federation would respond favorably to it. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but the only way we're going to find out is if we try. Let's put that proposal on the table. It's an eminently reasonable proposal and see how they respond. If they're totally unreasonable in their response, then we can figure out what we do next. But we haven't even tried. But and the this best, is unforgivable. But the best wouldn't be willing to do that. They're hell bent on you know, weakening Russia and selling their liquefied gas. And I agree. And that's exactly why we have to throw the bums out of office. These people in the West are now so, so politically invested in total victory that it, I, I regret to say, and I hope to God that I'm wrong about this, that they're not willing to have that conversation with the Russian no. government. Okay, we're that gonna... means we need to replace them. Okay, so now there's a question that typed in that, and I'm just going to read it by Noah because he doesn't have a mic. So, Dimitri, he wants to know, what is it like outside the venues where you're speaking? He knows that some of them had picketers and people videoing and all sorts of things. Have you had that? And I know also on that, Medea Benjamin actually had some violence at one of her 
demonstrations here in the US. Uh, what, is, what is it like outside the venues where you're going to? Well, of the six speeches I've spoken to thus far, there's been no picketing, no mm -hmm. protests whatsoever. Uh, at, two, uh, at four of them, I'm sorry, at four of the six. Uh, there was a protest and picketing, as I mentioned, in Hamilton, but I didn't see any violence or threats of violence. It was just, you know, robust disruption. Uh, and I, you know, I, I, I have no objection to that. Uh, and then there was uh, the one time I saw something which really kind of made me feel creepy was there was a, a fellow uh, who showed up in Toronto, you know, when we were outside greeting people who had not received the email about the cancellation. And he was, he was videotaping everybody who was showing up. And I later found out, and I'll, I, I'm willing to mention his name because he went public, uh, that this is a character by the name of Kevin Metcalf, um, which was really quite surprising and disappointing to me because Mr. Metcalf, uh, some of you may know, uh, he was an employee of the Canadian uh, Journalist for Free Expression several years ago. And uh, in his capacity as an employee of the CJFE, he put out an, a, a, a press release condemning Israel for war crimes. And when he did that, I, I defended him that he was then fired. I repeatedly publicly defended him, and for some reason, Mr. Metcalf thought it was, you know, uh, respect, uh, I don't know, from, for, for, that he was promoting peace by showing up uh, at this venue and videotaping all of us and then, you know, publishing video about who we were. Uh, I don't know, I, I suspect that Mr. Metcalf has been, uh, you know, duped by the propaganda around this war, regrettably. And to be perfectly blunt about it, a uh, significant proportion of the progressive and leftist community has been through about the propaganda around this war. I just, okay. want, to, I just want to add very quickly on that. I, I think we have to be like honest with ourselves that a substantive segment of those who are trying to shut this tour down are actually, they self-identify as being on the left. I don't think that's the majority. I think it is a majority coming from like sort of openly DND funded, you know, whatever forces. But there are, there are a number of, of self-described leftist Twitter accounts, for instance, who are totally happy and are boasting. They're saying, they're saying this is just like what <clears throat> has been done with trans rights kind of uh, protest movements and trying to shut down, you know, like turfs and all this kind of stuff. So, so, so there is a chunk of left liberal world that is totally into this kind of uh, um, sort of suppression. Yeah. And very true. Eve, I want to just add uh, one thing about that. Uh, and it's my advice to everybody on this call who's confronted by a self-professed progressive or leftist who supports sending weapons to Ukraine. Ask that person this when they're debating with you. Do you support sending weapons to the Palestinian people? Yeah. Yeah, straight up. I would be shocked if any of them says yes. Any of them. And then ask them to explain how they justify not supporting, not calling for the delivery of weapons to Palestinians while they demand, not only demand that we send weapons to Ukrainians, but they try to shut down anybody who criticizes that policy. Yeah, great answer. Okay, and finally, Nadia, can you? Uh... Uh, yes, um, first of all, uh, I admire your courage, uh, both uh, Eve and, and um, Dimitri, uh, it, it's unbelievable how courageous you are. Um, and I just wanted to know, how is it possible that we, we now live in a polarized world where we pay lip service to, um, uh, to freedom of speech, but we don't allow the other guy, you know, the opposite view. Is it one point of view that we have? Orwell's world where there's only one, uh, uh, official point of view and the rest of the, I'm, I'm appalled by what's happening. Okay, yeah, I think we'd all agree with that. Um, I just want to get your judgment call on this, Eve and Dimitri. Um, so we have one last person with their hand up. The only thing is they didn't put their name in it. All they have written is Russia is a terrorist state. So I'll let it be a judgment call for you two. Do you think we should let them ask their question or? I'm fine with that. Go ahead. I mean, okay. Go all ahead. right. So I'm going to, all right. Be prepared, Dimitri. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, whoever you are. I don't know why you didn't have the decency to put your name in. Hi. Go ahead. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. We hear you. 
Amazing. Uh, my, uh, my name is Bogdan and I'm Ukrainian. I actually lived in Ukraine for uh, almost all my life. And I travel all around Ukraine a lot. And I travel all around Russia and I speak Russian and Ukrainian, obviously. And uh, the only time I saw a uh, fascist nationalist in Ukraine, it was only on the TV, on the Russian state TV. I never saw them in Ukraine while I lived there. On the other hand, uh, I have my family who are on the front line is fighting against Russians. And I have a, uh, one of my family member died two weeks ago, protecting my country. And the reason why I'm here in Canada, because Russia attacked Ukraine, because I cannot bring my kid back to Ukraine. So my question is, uh, why wouldn't you ask Ukrainians, Ukrainian soldiers who are on the front line, do they need their support or not? Do they need the NATO support or not? Uh, I'm happy to answer the gentleman's mm -hmm. question. Thank you for the question. Eve, did you want to say something first? No, go ahead. Okay. So first of all, sir, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear uh, that you lost a family member in this war. Uh, and this is precisely why I think we need to bring it to an end, because there are literally thousands upon thousands of Ukrainian men and some civilians who are dying in this war. And that's really what my ultimate priority is, is to bring an end to the war. I don't want there to be a winner and a loser, because I think if we demand that there be a winner or a loser, whoever side you're on, Ukraine is going to end up destroyed. That's the inevitable outcome of demanding on to, demanding total victory. Uh, so please be assured, sir, that I have ultimate, uh, as much compassion as I could possibly find the words to express for the people who are dying in this conflict and nothing I want more to avoid for the killing to stop. In terms of your question about uh, Nazism, I mean, I'll only refer you to one fact. I, I can't speak to your own personal experience, but there's one thing that's universally acknowledged by the mainstream media, as far as I can tell, and that is that in late 2018, the Ukrainian parliament declared a national holiday in favor of Stepan Bandera. And the historical, the historical record is absolutely clear that Stepan Bandera was a Nazi collaborator, an anti-Semite, and that the organization he co-founded, the OUN, uh, committed the massacre of tens of thousands of Poles, Jews, and Russians. Uh, and, and I say, I would ask you to consider, you know, how seriously can we take this, I, this claim that there isn't a neo-Nazi problem in Ukraine when the Ukrainian parliament itself has declared a national holiday for Stepan Bandera and even went further and made it a criminal offense. This too has been widely reported in the Western media. It made it a criminal offense for somebody to deny that Bandera and his supporters were heroes. Uh, it sounds to me that that's a pretty, pretty serious issue that we as Canadians should be concerned about. Yeah, and Dimitri, do you think if the, the US and UK had not intervened last uh, April and stopped the peace negotiations, which apparently had gone well, and there, we actually have the document now, that perhaps people like, unfortunately, our questioner's family member might not have been killed? I, I, couldn't, uh, I, I couldn't agree more with the idea that we were the, the, the suggestion that we were very close to peace by all accounts. I mean, obviously, I wasn't there. But based on the information available, including statements by former Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, who did apparently have some kind of a mediation role in those negotiations, the parties were very close to a deal. And as I understand it, it wouldn't have involved the secession of any territories uh, in these four oblasts in southeastern Ukraine. Uh, I, I understand that they were going to punt on the issue of Crimea. And the core issue in those negotiations was uh, NATO membership to Ukraine. And the, the Ukrainian government wisely was prepared to give that up, which would have simply respected the promise that NATO members made. And the reports are that the British prime minister at the time, Boris Johnson, probably with the support of the American government, went over to Ukraine. This was reported in the Ukrainian media. And at the critical moment, told Volodymyr Zelensky, that the US and UK would not support any peace deal along those lines, and that if we didn't do the peace deal, they would arm Ukraine to the teeth so that it would be enabled to defeat the Russian military. Hmm. So there almost was a peace deal, 
those are the big evidence available to us tells us that our own government sabotaged it. And now the Ukrainian people are faced with, with a situation where they would have to accept much worse terms in order to bring an end to the savagery. That's unforgivable. Our governments are responsible for that. Okay, Eve, should we? Yeah, I think uh, on that note, I, I mean, I that uh, the evidence is overwhelming. You, people can pretend it doesn't exist if they want, but the evidence is overwhelming. Uh, you could go back a little bit earlier. We didn't need this war, right? There was just negotiations back in the no NATO expansion back in December of 2021. Uh, you know, I it's it's all horrible. But um, thanks a lot, Dimitri, for uh, for joining us and um, uh, keep up the uh, good work with the tour. And everyone who's on the call still, please do uh, try to get out to some events, uh, share share uh, information about the events. Obviously, at this point, the tour is 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 you know bigger than just the specifics about what's being said at the events. It's now become like a sort of political rally, and obviously, we have to defeat this effort to shut down, even if you don't agree with every specific thing, this and that, that we have to be able to defeat this effort to shut down. Um, so please do uh, share information about upcoming events. And um, thanks everyone for, uh, for participating. Same place, same time uh, next week. Great session. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Take care.